All right, uh, let's go and review some things that we talked about in our last couple of lessons as we finish up our material from chapter 8 today. We talked about four fundamental forces of nature. What are the four fundamental forces, Kendall? Um, strong force, weak force, gravitational force, and electromagnetic. Good. Electromagnetic, strong, weak, gravitational. Of those, which is the strongest force? Class? Strong, strong force. Which is the weakest force? Gravitational, gravitational force, not weak force. Um, in fact, really, we don't know a whole lot about the weak force, but we believe the weak force helps to explain what, Audrey? Um, what kind of decay? Radioactive decay, not like, you know, possum on the side of the road decay. Nothing explained it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, weak force, we believe, explains radioactive decay. Um, where would we find gravitational force, Michael? Everywhere. Everywhere between any Body. two bodies, right? Any two objects will have a gravitational force. And gravitational force class is always attractive, attractive. always attracts the two objects together. Um, so theoretically, everyone is attracted to you. I mean, just think about that. You know, if that doesn't help your self-esteem. Now, they're not attracted very much, but they are. Everyone is attracted to you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I digress. Um, by the way, remember we've talked about the benefits of, you know, being fat? The fatter you are, the more attractive you are. Just saying, we're, you know, right? Okay, so <clears throat> in a physics point of view anyway. Um, there's some things that are more important than physics. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Uh, let's see, strong force. Uh, we said it was the strongest. Where do we find strong force, Kendall? In the nucleus of an atom. Only within the nucleus of an atom. Very small range for the strong force. I um, think that's what holds everything together in the, in the nucleus. Uh, let's see, electromagnetic force. Where do we find that? Okay, if there are electrically charged objects, um, for instance, uh, you know, you rub your feet across the floor on a cold, dry winter day, and your hair begins to stand on end, you're electrically charged. Now there is some sort of um, attraction or repulsion that you would give off uh, based on other objects, right? And so um, we would find that obviously magnetically uh, magnetic objects, we would see that as well. Charged bodies is the easiest way to say that. Um, and we said electromagnetic force, is that always attractive class? No, no, sometimes it's downright repulsive, isn't it? Uh, for instance, a South Pole with a South Pole, repulsive. Uh, two positively charged objects, repulsive. But opposites attract, at least with electrically charged bodies. Um, b -b 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 let's see, I think that pretty much takes care of that. Um, talked about two different views of our universe, of our solar system, maybe more specifically. The old view that Ptolemy put out there, Piaz and Ptolemy, uh, was what, Kendall? That the Earth was the center. That the Earth is the center of everything, and Michael, we called that the geocentric, geocentric model, or the geocentric view. And uh, everybody liked that until somebody came along and ruined it for all of us and told us that the sun was the center. Who was that? Copernicus. Copernicus. And what, do we, what is that term that refers to the sun being the center class? Yes. Heliocentric, and that's actually reality. And so uh, thanks to Copernicus, we know everything goes around the sun. Thanks to another guy, we know how everything goes, not everything, everything in our solar system, how everything in the solar system goes around the sun. Who is the guy who came up with the laws of planetary motion? Kepler. Now, we want to pause and give credit to the teacher because teachers are important. Who was his teacher? Anyone remember? Who taught him everything he knew? Left all the charts, all the diagrams, all the observations? Mm -hmm. uh, Tycho or Braha, or Bra, right, or however you pronounce it. B R A H E. Thank you for remembering the teacher. Thank you. That, that touches my heart deeply. But Kepler still gets the credit because uh, they're Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The first law, we call it the law of orbits. Basically, what was that law of orbits? Um, planets go around an elliptical. Uh, planets go around an elliptical orbit or an ellipsis. And because of that, by the way, remember in the ellipse, there's two points that matter. Not just one point that matters, like in a circle, two points that matter. What do we call them, anyone? Foci or focal points. And uh, one of those foci will be the sun. The other was just an empty point in space near the sun. 
And we said that because of that, there is a point where the planet will be closer to the sun than at other points. What do we call that closest point to the sun in orbit? Anyone? Perihelion, the other helion, right? Peri, remember, means around or surrounding, so it's right around the sun, right? For instance, if, uh, if I'm around Kendall, you wouldn't expect it to be three rooms over, right? If I'm around Kendall, I'm, I'm near Kendall, so around the sun, perihelion. And then aphelion is the point where it's furthest from the sun. Remember, ap means away from. So um, apostate is the word I remember all the time. You know, somebody who goes away from what they used to believe. Um, so aphelion is the furthest point. The second law, it's called the law of areas, which, you know, whatever. There's a reason for it. The bottom line said this. When a planet is at the perihelion, it is moving fastest. And when it's at the aphelion, it's moving slowest. slowest. Basically, the closer the planet is to the sun, faster. the faster it moves. And the further it is from the sun, the slower it moves. Now, again, we did mention all of the orbits are nearly circular. Again, but um, technically not perfect circles, though. And then we also had the third law, which was the law of periods, which talked about how long it takes to get around. What was the basic gist of that, Audrey? The people running around a track. That didn't jog her memory. <laughs> you get it, John. Sorry. All right. You had to, if you were just on vacation with dad and had to do all, deal with all his dad jokes, I tell you. Anyway, um, she just remembered one of them. Hey, credit to uh, credit to our, our brother there. Um, she laughed when she thought of one of your jokes. Uh, so anyway. Um... Sorry, I interrupted you. You actually started to say something, but I wanted to get my dad joke in. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Good. Not so much the faster you're moving necessarily, but the less time it takes to get around. So the quicker the orbit is. So planets that are closer to the sun, on average, take uh, less time to get around the sun. Now, there was a proportional relationship. Anyone happen to remember the proportional relationship? It's proportional to r cubed. Yeah, so the cube of the average distance is proportional to the square of the time to get around. Anyway, you're closer, you get around quicker. All right, um, and we said the Kepler's laws were based purely on observation because you cannot experiment with this. What is that term that refers to uh, only based on observation? You didn't actually do any work in experimenting. Empirical. Empirical. So I don't know if this will help you remember, mm -hmm. but like if you're the emperor, you're, you're in charge of the empire, you just sit and watch everything. You don't actually do anything. Everybody else does everything for you. So they're just based on observation. They're just watching. I don't know. That's probably not where it comes from, but if that helps you remember. They're empirical laws, laws based on observation. Um, we also said all they do is explain what happens. They don't actually tell you why. So, because all they do is explain what happens, Kendall, we would say that they were Audrey, Michael, not helpful. No, they were helpful. They were helpful. Kinematic. Remember, kinematics refers to study of motion without regard to causes. So, yeah, there were kinematic and empirical laws. Sir Isaac Newton's laws, though, kind of explained why everything worked that way between inertia. And this pull of gravity causing acceleration, we have the planets going around in the ellipses where they speed up as they get closer because there's a stronger force, more acceleration. But because they've got that acceleration, they then go away past the sun because of inertia before they're pulled back around again. So it's a speed up, slow down, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. And we, now again, that's a little exaggerated. It's not dramatic like that, but we get the basic idea there. Um, so, since gravitational force is what causes all of this, uh, we gave, I gave you right at the end of the hour last time, this is where we pick it up, the universal law of gravitation in formula form. You can look at your notes for this. What was that universal law of gravitation, Kendall? F equals G times uh, M1 plus M2 all over M2. There we go. So the force of gravitation is proportional to, again, this is just a constant of proportionality, the product of the two masses 
and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And we do need to know this if you would, and I don't think we had time to get this. This R is the distance between the centers. What we'll call the center of mass or the center of gravity. Talk a little bit about that if we have time at the end of the hour. So the R is the distance between their centers. The M's are the masses. So by virtue of you being really fat, you have more gravitational force that you give off. If another person is also fat, they are even more strongly attracted to you. So a, strong, a fat person attracts another fat person more strongly than a fat person attracts a skinny person. But two skinny people don't attract each other very much at all. Anyway, um, again, from a physics standpoint, well, I want you to look at a couple of large people and how attractive they are to each other in just a little bit. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, I have a math problem for that. All right. <laughs> Um, now, the, uh, the G, the G, we said, is a constant of proportionality. There's an interesting thing, as you read in your homework reading, you should have seen a diagram of how uh, a scientist named Cavendish came up with a way of testing, measuring this actual value of G using some lead spheres and a, a uh, carefully measured uh, calculation there. What is this value of G from your notes, Audrey? There we go. So the 6.673 E negative 11 is the hard part, right? Remembering that. You already know force is going to be Newton, so there's your N. You have distance squared. Well, distance is measured in meters. You have meter squared in the bottom, so you need meter squared in the top to cancel that. And you have two different masses. Well, each mass is kilograms. You have two kilograms in the top. You need kilograms squared in the bottom, so hence the denominator, to cancel that. Basically, just remember the units are all going to work out. Turn to page 129 in your textbooks if you would. Let's look at a couple of problems dealing with this. Page 129, look at problem number 12 and read that for us if you would. Michael. What is the gravitational attraction of the sun on Earth, of the Earth to the sun? All right, so we have the sun. And about 93 million miles away, we have... The Earth. This is not drawn to scale. Earth is way smaller than that drawn to scale, but whatever. Sun. Now, we need to know a couple things. First, we need to know the masses. And if you look on the page, you should see a, um, a big capital M sub S, right, right underneath where it says problems. That is the mass of the Sun. And class, that number is? Uh, 1.99 times 10 to 30 kilograms. Yeah, 1.99 E 30 kilograms. And then we have Earth. That would be the capital M sub E for mass of Earth, which is class? Okay. You say, how did they calculate these? This is why other people get paid a lot more than me, because they're smart and they figure these things out. All right. Um, we need the distance between their centers. Now. The book gives you the distance from the Earth to the Sun, but that's the distance from surface to surface. What is this distance, class, from Earth to Sun? 1.50 E11 meters. But then we also have to account for the radius of the Earth. And uh, it should give you the radius of the Earth, class. So there's another 6 million meters radius of the Earth, okay? And then we also have to account for the radius of the Sun. And um, they don't give you the radius of the Sun. Here's, here's a number that you'll jot down just right there where all the other numbers are. Just jot this down. R sub S for radius of Sun is 6.96 E8 meters. 6.96 E8 meters. And I know that because in the answer key, they show how to work it, and they give you that number in the answer key. I'm just not sure why they didn't give it to you in your textbook. So anyway, uh, 6.96 E8 meters. What we're going to have to do then is calculate the distance between the centers. Does that make sense? So we're just going to have to add all three of those numbers together. So on your calculator, add them up. Now, you might remember at the beginning of the year, we would have had to change all of these to E11s. But we know how to do scientific notation on the calculator now, so who cares? 6.96 E8 plus 1.5 E11 plus 6.38 E6 equals. 
and you should get the what for your uh, for your total distance between their centers. Audrey? Uh, 1.5 Good. Keep this in the memory of your calculator. 1.507 blah 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 E11 is our R value. Now, um, in order to do the calculation, keep in mind anything that comes in front of or after a fraction class could be in the numerator. So practically speaking, I'm going to multiply the G times the M times the M and then divide by R squared or divide by memory squared. So clear the calculator. You've still got that memory though. I'm going to start with the G value, 6.673E negative 11 times Mass 1 was 1.99E30 times mass 2 was 5.98E24 equals. I have a really big number in the top. <clears throat> then I have to divide it by recall 1 squared equals. And uh, we get a very strong force between the sun and the earth, which is why it keeps the earth moving around it. What do we get for our answer here? Call it when you got it. Right. Hey, 3.496 blah 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 E22. Anyone got that? You do. Newtons. All right. Re enter it on the calculator. Assuming we still have the memory in there, correct? All right. Let's try it again on the calculator because that's really the hardest part of this, really. 6.673 E negative 11. Now, in your case, Audrey, it's 6.673 E. 11, and then when you hit the negative, it'll put the negative on the 11. Times 1.99 E30 times 5.98 E24. So you're taking these two masses, multiplying them times this 6.673 negative 11. Hit equals. Divide that by recall 1 squared and then hit equals again. Got it now? Michael's still not. Slightly different calculator. Tell you what, while I work with Michael, you start on number 13. All right, so that's that. Okay, so that's in the memory. Okay, so 6.673 times 10 to the negative 11 times. Oh, you know what I bet it's trying to do? I bet it's trying to multiply 11 times something. So, yeah, you're going to want to put parentheses. That's annoying. Okay, times parentheses. That looks right. Divided by the... Okay, divided by it again. Divide by one more time. Because remember, we're dividing by r squared, right? So you divided by r. Two ways to the one way to divide by r squared is to divide by answer squared, or divide by radius, divide by radius again, which is basically dividing by radius squared, and that's where we get this number. Okay, sig figs, of course, the thing was three sig figs. We don't have to three point five zero e twenty two newtons. All right, so some of you have already started on thirteen. Very similar problem, except this time the big object is the Earth. Because the moon relative to the Earth is smaller. Not as dramatically smaller, but smaller. All right, so Earth, there you go. South America, there's Florida, and uh, Greenland, you know, Iceland, Ireland, Great Britain, Scandinavia, Denmark. Spain, Italy, boop, Greece, Turkey, Africa. <clears throat> Lemurs live there. Uh, <laughs> India. Oh, okay, that's Earth. Just because. Audrey inspires me. What can I say? And then, moon. There's craters. And it looks like a person. It's a man in the moon. Okay? All right. What's the distance from Earth to moon class? <coughs> but we also have to count for <coughs> the radius of the Earth. Uh, 
and we have to account for the radius of the moon. So from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon, how far apart? Find it, put it in memory. Adding the three numbers. Um, Alright, put that in the memory of your calculator. Assuming we all got that. Okay. Now then, to find the force of attraction between moon and earth, what's the equation we're going to use, class? F equals G times M sub 1 times M sub 2 over R squared. Notice I just shifted the G up to the top. So, what is our value of G, Kendall? Um, 6.673 E negative. Okay, and then we're going to have two masses, and we're going to divide by our memory squared. All right, the first mass is the mass of the Earth. We just used that a minute ago, class. That's the radius of the Earth, mass of the Earth. 7.35. Ooh, mass of the Earth, M sub E? Uh, 5.9 E24. Okay, 5.9 E24, and uh, kilograms. And then the mass of the Moon. 7.35 E. There we go. So we've got our two masses. So, you take 6.673 E negative 11. You multiply that by 5.98 E24. You multiply that by 7.35 E22. You divide it by recall 1 squared equals. Don't forget to equals at the end. And how much attraction is there between Earth and Moon? 7.47. That's not what I got. 1.97. That's what I got. 1.9075 blah 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 E20 or 1.91 E20 newtons. That's what you got? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what Michael got. Audrey's re it. Team. We have a couple of 60 kilogram people. They're about 130 pounds or so. So this is like, I don't know, maybe the maybe Dylan and Brandon are standing a meter apart from each other. Believe it or not, and they would argue this, they they are attractive. Very you wouldn't you might not even agree with that, okay? But anyway, how much force draws them together? That's number 14 at your seats. Two 60 kilogram people, they're standing one meter apart. How much force attracts them to each other?
All right, so Brandon's just standing there minding his own business. Dylan's just standing there supposedly minding his own business. All of a sudden, Dylan crashes into Brandon and knocks him down. Brandon says, why'd you do this? It wasn't me. Gravitational force. Well, again, using this formula, if both masses are um, 60 kilograms, now the R is the one meter between their bodies or between the centers of mass. Technically it should be between the center of mass. We're gonna roll with it anyway. Nice thing about squaring a meter class, so does one. So really all you had to do was 6.673E negative 11 times 60 times 60. And uh, how much force forced Dylan to crash into Brandon class? Yeah, point zero 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 two four newtons. Yeah, nothing. That's it. No, it's not gravitational force that did that, right? Yeah. It was it was Michael. <laughs> Michael was the force that caused that. Well, but what if what if they were bigger, right? Or maybe a little bit closer together, right? I mean, and so I try to think who are some of the biggest humans in this country or even in the world. Because America has the biggest humans in general. And uh, I thought, offensive and defensive linemen in the NFL. And I thought, you know, you know, you got this big old offensive tackle who's down in a stance, and right next to him, like almost touching helmets, is this big old defensive lineman. And they're really close together. And they got to hold that stance. And there is a force that pulls them together, right? So if the one guy falls, starts, or goes off sides, like, is it really his fault or is it physics? So let's, uh, let's, let's consider some big people here. Let's suppose we have a 145 kilogram offensive tackle and uh, he is 0.725 meters away. That's center of mass, by the way. They're closer than that helmet to helmet uh, from a 142 kilogram defensive end. How much force draws the defensive end off sides? Or maybe it was just the quarterback's hard count cadence. Anyway. How much force draws them together? Because it's obviously going to be more than a couple wiry people like Dylan and Brandon. Which thanks to Brother Hanks, we now know wiry is code for ski man. There's definitely more force this time, but it's still like negligible. What is it, anyone? Yeah, it, it's it's really nothing. Um, that many newtons? No, that's that's not doing anything at all. So here's the point: even though a really fat person is physically attractive. It's not very attractive, is it? So, better off to put, hang your hat on something else besides just being attractive to everyone by being fat. Anyway, heart attacks. You know, you do attract heart attacks more strongly, but anyway, questions on this. Did you say physics? Please? Physically, as opposed to physically attractive. Physically attractive. Anyway, that was a dad joke, subtle, so. All right, questions on that. Now, what might cause the offensive or defensive lineman is um, if they get down in their stance, there's a reason they usually put a hand on the ground and it's because if they did it, they might fall forward, right? There's something called stability that an object has or does not have. And then there's on the conflict side, instability. It all has to do with the center of an object's mass. So in you, if we were to measure from the front to the back of you, right about there, and then this way, center of you, 
And then vertically, I think uh, guys, it's right about here. Ladies, it's a little higher. But there's a point in you that is called the center of mass. Now, for you who've already had geometry, remember we talked about the centroid of a triangle. And the centroid would be the part, if you cut a triangle out of a piece of cardboard, cardstock, whatever, and you strung it up by the centroid, it would hang perfectly level. At any other point, it would tilt. But at the centroid, it would hang perfectly level. There is a point, if we were to uh, string you up, right through the middle, right, there's a point where we could find on you that would cause you to hang and balance perfectly level, okay? would be very painful too, but whatever, okay? There is a point that would cause you to hang level also. The key would be supporting at that point. That's called your center of mass or your center of gravity, okay? Sometimes represented CG, just center of gravity. If the center of gravity is supported by the base, then you're good. For instance, uh, as you look at my feet, uh, if I were to draw a little line around my feet, that weird shape would be my base of support. As long as my center of gravity is directly above some part of the base of support, I'm fine. So if I lean this way, the center of gravity is still over the base of support. This way, this way, and then right about there, it starts to get outside the base of support. Does that make sense? This is why in sports and athletics, especially playing defense, right? Um, uh, basketball players, you'll get their ankles broken. Okay, why? Because as they're trying to play defense, if they're too upright, and uh, they try to make a move, they can get their center of gravity outside the base of support, they lose their footing, they fall down, and then it looks really embarrassing. So the key, remember, is to get low and get your feet spread wide. The wider your feet, the bigger you just expanded your base of support, right? If you have bigger feet, that also gives you a bigger base of support. Also, if you can put one foot forward, one foot backward, that helps to increase your base of support as well because now it forms a diagonal instead of a straight line across. That's what stability is all about is causing the center of gravity to stay inside the base of support. Go ahead and write that down. Stability is where the center of gravity is within or is over the base of, the base of support. You would say that that is a stable position. A stable position. Now, within stability then, if the object is simply existing, we would say the object is at rest. The object is what's called static equilibrium. Static equilibrium. If the object is not moving, the object is simply stationary, like my water bottle. It is simply sitting on my desk, not moving. It is in a position of static equilibrium. Well, within static equilibrium, there's a few different ways that an object can be in static equilibrium. The one is if the object is truly stable, is truly stable. Here's what would cause an object to be truly stable. If the center of gravity is not easily lowered, if the center of gravity is not easily lowered, or that is if the object is not easily tipped over or knocked over. This water bottle right now, I'm tapping it, it's not falling over. Why? Because the center of gravity is not easily lowered. The reason for that is that the center of gravity for this bottle is down around here. It's already kind of low. If I were to, I thought I had another bottle ready at hand, we'll go with this one. This bottle, the center of gravity is up higher. Why? There's more stuff in it, right? So for this bottle, if I tap it the same way, it falls over more easily. Now, as long as nothing happens to it, it's not going to inherently fall over on its own. We would say both of these bottles are stable. This one more so. Again, this is another reason why a basketball player or defender tries to get lower. They get more stable. Football players, they always talk about low man wins. Why? Because you're less likely to fall down if you can get your center of gravity as low as possible. I remember one kid, I, I used to clean the physics lab when I was in high school. Uh, I cleaned the physics lab one year because the science teacher was nice and she paid me money to do it. And so I'd come in, I was early every single morning. I know you're usually here really early. I was like, I had nothing to do for 30 minutes. So I would clean the physics lab. She'd give me a little bit of money for it. Shout out to Miss Eamon. She's not Miss Eamon anymore. She's Mrs. Something. I just don't remember her married name. 
she left when she got married. So anyway, um, but I would clean the physics lab and there was this one kid, he always wanted the lowest stool. So the stools in our science lab are all the same height. That science lab, there were different height stools for different height people. Like somebody who's maybe more vertically challenged might need a higher stool to be able to reach the countertop. Um, we just don't discriminate against short people. We give everybody the same height stool. And so some people may struggle to reach the tabletop and this case, our tabletops are a little lower than they were in our science lab. But it was one of the lowest stool, and his reasoning, he said, was, I want to have a lower set of gravity so I don't fall over as easily. I thought you are a nerd. Anyway, <laughs> center of gravity is not easily lower. Then we have uh, what would be called unstable equilibrium. Unstable equilibrium. And that's what we have now. It is an equilibrium. What I just did to the water bottle by resting it on its cap is that its center, its base of support is so much smaller now, isn't it? And so now the little disturbance <coughs> causes it to fall over, okay? So, <laughs> anyway, um, the, the center of gravity is still the same height it was before just about, but by shrinking the base of support, the slightest disturbance would lower the center of gravity and would cause it to tip over. So if you'll note that, a slight disturbance could tip or lower the center of gravity. <clears throat> Just a slight disturbance would tip or lower the center of gravity. So for instance, if I spread my feet out and get low, you could hit me, push on me, I'm going to be able to resist a lot down here. Here, I just raised my center of gravity, and by having feet together, I could get knocked over somewhat easily. I could get knocked over really easily. Now, in fact, I might not even need to be touched to fall over. If I tried to balance on the tips of my toes, it's that much harder because I'm shrinking that base of support. Does that make sense? So that, that carefully balanced object, right? That's what we're thinking of for unstable. Now, not moving, okay, so for instance, not moving, but definitely not stable, correct? Okay, that's unstable static equilibrium. The last has, it's kind of a weird one, it's neutral <clears throat> equilibrium. Neutral equilibrium, where the object isn't moving, but even if you did move the object, so it was no longer in static equilibrium, you wouldn't lower the center of gravity. For instance, if I were to roll this bottle or turn the bottle or move the bottle, the center of gravity isn't moving. It's staying the same height, isn't it? Yet the object moves. A rolling object displays neutral equilibrium because the center of gravity isn't lowering. It's not tipping over, but it is moving, yet the center of gravity is staying at the same height. So it can be overturned without lowering that center of gravity. This is only going to be true of some object that is rolling. Ball, water bottle, whatever. The book gives you some, some sketches there of uh, a cone. And a cone can demonstrate these different types of equilibrium. Sitting on the base, nice big base of support, stable equilibrium. Try to balance it carefully on the point. Hmm, a little harder to do, unstable equilibrium and you lay it on one of its sides so it can roll around, well, neutral equilibrium. Make sense? Now, there is also this state that is not even stability, but rather instability. And this is the situation for an object where the center of gravity is unsupported. An object with an unsupported center of gravity is in a position of instability. Now that doesn't mean the object is falling over, believe it or not. You can continue forward in a position of instability. Think of it this way. When you ride a bike, have you ever tried to just sit on a bike? It doesn't work, does it? You fall over. Even with a kickstand up, it doesn't usually work. Particularly, have you noticed when you round a corner on a bike, you lean your body? Could you do that if the bike were still? Definitely not. But what you have is inertia. You have forward movement, and the forward movement carries you through that time of instability. But if somehow, as you're making the turn, you suddenly hit the brakes and stopped, you would definitely fall over, wouldn't you? 
Now, there is a way you could lean so far to the side that you could fall over even with your forward movement. But that inertia, something we'll talk about in chapter 13, rotational inertia, keeps you right on moving even when you lean, of, lean to the side. Does that make sense? But if the base of support falls outside, or the center of gravity falls outside the base of support, we have instability. Rounding a sharp curve. The book gives an example of a camper that's driving along a hillside. As long as he's moving at a decent clip along that road, he'll actually be fine. He'll keep that moving forward. But if we were to stop, it would topple over if that center of gravity falls outside the base of support of those wheels. Questions on that? Now, the book then talks about center of mass contrasted with center of gravity. What's the difference? Well, center of gravity is the single point on an object that affects, um, that, that affects all motion. For instance, if, um, heaven forbid, Kendall were at the top of a very tall building and she were to be kind of shoved off, she might kind of spin and flip as she goes through the air. But there's one point on Kendall that would move in a perfectly straight line. Feet are kind of doing whatever, arms are doing whatever, heads doing whatever, but that one point on Kendall's body would fall in a perfectly straight line. That, it's as though that one point is being dragged by gravity and it disregards everything else about Kendall's body. Just that one point's coming down. It's as if gravity is pulling on that center point. Hence, we call it center of gravity. Well, what if now Kendall is an astronaut? She goes to outer space and she's on the spacewalk away from everything else. And Kendall leaps off of a surface, pushes off, applies a force, and her body starts to flip and go over end. There's one point on Kendall's body that will continue moving in a straight line at a constant speed until she acts, is acted upon by some other outside force. But we can't call it the center of gravity because there ain't no gravity. There's just Kendall doing this weird gyration through the air in her spacesuit. But that one point continues moving in a straight line at a constant speed, as if the rest of her body doesn't even matter. It's all about that one point. Well, we can't call it center of gravity, so we call it center of mass. It's the same thing. It's just we refer to it outside Earth's gravity as center of mass, and within Earth's gravity, we call it center of gravity. Now, that also brings up this point. In outer space, Kendall would have an attraction to another object. And if there are no other outside forces present, there may be enough. Probably not, she's kind of small. Gravitational force to actually attract that other object. Okay, that's gravitational force. Gravity is basically the same thing, but we specifically, we reserve the use of the word gravity to mean the gravitational attraction by some celestial body. So the sun exerts gravity on other objects. It pulls the planets in by what we call gravity. Earth exerts gravity to pull us in. When we go to the moon, there is less gravity. Kendall does not have a gravity that attracts Audrey or Michael or her desk or her pen. She has a gravitational force, but not gravity. Does that make sense? Just wanted to clarify that as well. All right, one last thing I wanted to point out. I wasn't sure if we'd have time to get to it. I just want to point it out on page 125. We could calculate using, it's not up here anymore, the uh, gravitational force equation, we could actually calculate the acceleration due to gravity at any point on Earth if we could calculate the gravitational attraction at that point. Based on that, you see a line up here of the various values of g. At the equator, notice g is very strong, 9.78. Um, we see at the Panama Canal, it's strong. And then you see it kind of weakening. You see less and less grav. Or to me, it's weakest at the equator. I was about to say something's wrong there. It should be weakest. We see the weakest gravitational acceleration at the equator. Why? Because the Earth bulges at the equator and it's slightly squished to the poles. As you approach the North Pole, okay, so you're kind of working your way upward. As you get closer and closer to the North Pole, you notice that the uh, gravitational acceleration is stronger by about 0 0.05 meters per second squared. It's not that great. Look at what it would be in Washington, D.C., 9.80. Well, we're a little further south than that. Okay, Charleston, South Carolina, 9.795. Still rounds to 9.80. We're here in Georgia. We might even be a little weaker. We might actually be 9.79 where we are, though we're down in the valley as opposed to up on the mountains. Anyway, the point is elevation makes a difference. The point is that um, latitude from the equator makes a difference. If you averaged out all those numbers, it'd be about 9.80, and that's why we go with that number. But I did want to point that out as well. Questions on this?
and just say about, you take about 300 miles above Earth's surface to stop feeling this gravitational pull. Um, there is still technically um, gravity pulling on you. You just don't feel it the way you did before. But it gets weaker the higher and higher you get. All right, homework for this evening. You've got a handout to complete. It's going to give you some practice with this chapter's math. Tomorrow, then, I'd like to quickly review terms and focus on last chapter's math. Last chapter with the components, projectiles, velocities and accelerations, and x and y, I think it requires a little bit more of our time still. So we're going to try to focus time on that. So this handout will review chapter 8 math, we'll review terms, then we'll get into chapter 7 math review. Again, lesson 57, we have our test coming up, test 5 over chapter 7 and 8. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and when well, the bell has rung, so you are dismissed.